Good morning, and welcome to our worship from this beautiful part of Devon, on the eastern slopes of Dartmoor. And what better place to be, as today we celebrate Moorland Sunday, the third Sunday of the season of creation. In our service today, we'll be thinking about this particular part of God's creation, a landscape which is stunningly beautiful, and yet within moments can become like a threatening wilderness. A terrain of rugged tours, which is also remarkably sensitive to the impact of humankind. But let's begin our time together with prayer. We meet in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, you are in this place. Fill us with your power. Cover us with your peace. And assure us of your presence. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning assures us of God's unfailing love, day after day. New every morning is the love. As we draw close to God, we seek his forgiveness for the times when we've let him down and let ourselves down. As we open our hearts to him, he will wash us clean. O oh God, our creator, your kindness has brought us the gift of a new morning. Help us to leave yesterday and not to covet tomorrow, but to accept the uniqueness of today. By your love, celebrated in your word, seen in your Son, breathed by your Spirit. Take from us what we need carry no longer, so that we may be free again to choose to serve you, and to be served by one another. Holy God, Maker of all, have mercy on us. Jesus Christ, Servant of the poor, have mercy on us. Holy Spirit, breath of life, have mercy on us. May God forgive us, Christ renew us, and the Spirit enable us to grow in love. Amen. Joel chapter 1 verses 8 to 10 and 17 to 20. Lament like a virgin dressed in sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn 
the ministers of the Lord. The fields are devastated, the ground mourns, for the grain is destroyed, the wine dries up, the oil fails. The seeds shrivel under the clods, the storehouses are desolate, the granaries are ruined because the grain has failed. How the animals groan, the herds of cattle wander about because there is no pasture for them, even the flocks of sheep are dazed. To you, O Lord, I cry, for fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and flames have burned all the trees of the field. Even wild animals cry out to you, because the watercourses are dried up, and fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and was baptised by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open, and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert for forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. There's something about Mark's Gospel which conveys a real sense of urgency. He's got a message that matters, and there isn't much time to tell it. It's by far the shortest of the four Gospels, and as you read through it, you can almost feel yourself becoming breathless as you try to keep up with the unfolding drama. There's no gentle introduction, no setting of the scene, nothing about Jesus' birth, his family, or his childhood years. And it starts with a bang. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's all about the good news. And in today's reading from Mark's Gospel, just nine verses into the first chapter, we hear about Jesus' baptism and about his temptation in the wilderness, all in five short verses. And Mark is keen to show us how closely those events were linked. Jesus emerges from the water and the voice of God is heard affirming Jesus as his beloved son. And then, in the following verse, Mark tells us, At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert. How often in life do we experience this? Just as something wonderful happens, we're brought back down to earth with a bump. Or conversely, just when we think things can't get any worse, something will happen to turn things round like the sun coming out from behind a dark cloud. Life can be a real roller coaster of emotions. But there's an important message we can take from the order in which Mark records these events. After Jesus comes up out of the water, God immediately proclaims him as his son and affirms his love for him. At that point, Jesus hasn't actually done anything other than to come for baptism. He hasn't yet overcome the temptations he's about to endure, and his public ministry hasn't even started. But God's love for his son isn't dependent on what he's done. It's about who he is. My beloved son. His love is unconditional. God's love for each one of us is just the same, unconditional. Despite what society may tell us, we're not what we do. We're not what we have. We're not what others may think about us. Whatever we may have done in our lives, God loves us for who we are, as his beloved children. And perhaps we sometimes need to remember that in our relationships with others, that they too need to hear those words, that they're loved for who they are. So today is Moreland Sunday. Living on the edge of Dartmoor, we're well placed to experience the beauty and grandeur of moorland landscapes. On a clear day, there's nothing more breathtaking. But we also know how quickly this can change. Within minutes, the temperature can fall, and the moor can be enveloped by thick fog or driving rain, obliterating all points of reference and leaving the unprepared traveller totally disorientated. The moor can become, in an instant, a wilderness on our doorstep. The image of wilderness is frequently used throughout the Bible, almost as a metaphor from being, for being separated from God, 
or searching for a closer relationship with him. Like the Israelite people, wandering for 40 years through the wilderness of Sinai in their search for the promised land. Or the desolation that befell Jerusalem and Judea when the Babylonians overthrew the land. Or like the wilderness so graphically described in our reading from the prophet Joel. People sometimes describe wilderness situations, whether real or metaphorical, as being God-forsaken. But this could not be further from the truth. There is no part of his creation that God would choose to forsake. And indeed, wherever the media describe a place or situation as being God-forsaken, because of some aspect of desolation or suffering, we can expect God to show up in some way. In our own time, people often refer to periods of their lives when things haven't gone to plan as being their wilderness years, times of trouble, times to be endured. You may well have experienced times like that yourself. Maybe that's where you are right now. If so, take heart. Very often it's those periods when God is at mo most at work within us, changing us and preparing us for what's to come. A time when we can learn more about God and about ourselves. When Jesus was in the wilderness, he wasn't simply being tempted by Satan as a once and for all test of his suitability for the role of Messiah, after which time those temptations would go away. On the contrary, this was a time of preparation for Jesus, in readiness for all of the temptations that would be thrown at him throughout his ministry. Time and again, he'd be forced to make the choice between using his powers in the wrong way to satisfy worldly desires or doing things God's way. And to make things worse, those temptations would not only come from those who were overtly opposed to his mission, 
but also from those who were closest to him. Remember the time when Jesus told his disciples about how he would have to die, and Peter per tried to persuade him that this could never happen. How did Jesus respond? Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. One Sunday last year, Reverend Paul arranged a walk up Cosden Beacon, ending at the Triple Stone Row on the eastern flank of the hill. And as we got above the trees and onto the open moor, I was struck by the parallels between the terrain around me and the gospel accounts of Jesus' temptations. On the rough ground before me were many granite boulders. Could these be the stones that Satan told Jesus to turn into bread to satisfy his hunger? Then, looking back down towards South Torton, we could see the tower and pinnacles of St Andrew's Church. Somewhere for Jesus to jump from, so that he could be saved by the angels. And as we climbed higher, an amazing view opened up before us, and we could see all of the parishes within our mission community spread out beneath us. Was this where Jesus was supposed to bow down and worship Satan? The things that Jesus encountered during his ministry are often much closer to us than we might think. And if we're going to follow Jesus, then we too have to make choices between the things which satisfy our worldly desires and the things which bring us closer to God. As most of you will know, barring any last minute changes, I'm due to be ordained as a priest next Sunday. So next week I'll be on retreat in preparation for this new chapter in my life. But not in the usual way, within the confines of some peaceful abbey or retreat centre, but at home, with all the communication being carried out through the medium of Zoom. Just as Jesus used his time in the wilderness to prepare himself for his mission, we all need to take time and take a step back to prepare for new situations and new challenges in our lives not necessarily within a physical wilderness, but taking time to travel deep within ourselves and to listen to what God is saying to us. So for me, this week will be a time to think about what ordination really means for me and for the lives of those around me, about the changes it might require us to make and the temptations that we might face. In a sense, the next week will feel a bit like travelling inwards into a wilderness of the soul, to prepare for what's to come. It may be that some of you feel as though you're wandering through a spiritual wilderness right now. If so, don't be discouraged. This could be an opportunity for change, and for coming closer to God. As we heard in our reading from Mark's Gospel, for all of his time in the wilderness, Jesus was attended by angels, and while his temptations were real enough, he was never abandoned by God, and neither are we. Just as the Dartmoor fog can lift to reveal a clear blue sky, so the wilderness within us can give way to a clearer vision of our journey ahead. To paraphrase the words of Moses from the book of Deuteronomy, The Lord will sustain you in a desert land. In a howling wilderness he will shield you, care for you, and guard you as the apple of his eye. The wilder areas of Dartmoor are often regarded as thin places, places where the separation between earth and heaven is reduced, and God's presence can be felt in a very real way. This feeling is beautifully captured by the poet R.S. Thomas in his poem simply called The Moor. The Moor by R. S. Thomas It was like a church to me. I entered it on soft foot, breath held like a cap in the hand. It was quiet. What God was there made himself felt, not listened to, in clean colours that brought a moistening of the eye, in movement of the wind over grass. There were no prayers said, but stillness of the heart's passions 
That was praise enough and the mind's session of its kingdom. I walked on, simple and poor, while the air crumbled and broke on me, generously as bread. And so we come to our time of prayer. Loving God, you are Lord of all the wild places in your creation. The canyons and the deepest recesses of the earth are no mystery to you. The most inaccessible depths of the ocean know your presence. The tallest forest canopy, the most arid desert, the rockiest mountains, the windswept plains and moorlands everywhere, all witness to your glorious handiwork. You have honoured us with joint responsibility, with you for the care of all your creation and the life that flourishes around us. Thank you for this gift. Please help us to tread lightly on the earth and to remember that we are not above the rest of your creation, but are to nurture it. We thank you and pray for all those who work closely with the natural world to protect it. May we all act with responsibility and conservation in heart and mind to guard the precious heritage of your earth and the diversity of life that it supports. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of justice and peace, we pray for all in positions of authority in all levels of government. May they also act with responsibility and conservation in heart and mind. May they become men and women of integrity, who set an example by keeping their promises and agreements, and who obey the same rules they expect others to live by. Please guide their decisions in this challenging time of risk, political polarisation, change and uncertainty. We pray for the people and the habitats across the world, caught up in deathly devastation and loss caused by selfish human action or inaction. We thank you for all those who work ecologically for justice and peace in whatever capacity, for the benefit of all your creation, often putting themselves at risk one way or another. Please strengthen and encourage them in their purpose. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. God of grace and generosity, we thank you for all the gifts we receive from you and your creation. At this time of anxious, anxious concern for many, we thank you that you are always nearer to us than we realise. We pray for peace and healing and your blessing on your land and in our homes and communities, our places of education, our businesses, our health and social services, and our private care sector. We pray for all who work for the common good, whether paid or voluntary, and we pray for the work of your church in making the life of the risen Jesus within us and amongst us known. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bringing all our prayers together in the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning asks for God's guidance on our journey through life. Guide me, O thou great Redeemer.
Well, I hope you've enjoyed being with us this morning. As we come towards the end of our time together, a short prayer of blessing. See that you are at peace among yourselves and love one another. Take the example of the good men of ancient times and God will comfort and aid you, both in this world and in the world to come. And may the love of the Father who made us, the love of the Son who died for us and rose again, and the love of the Spirit who dwells within us, bless us and keep us, this day and all of our days. Amen. Take care, and we'll see you next time.